Hello everybody again. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about interference, wave interference, standing waves, and how standing waves are produced in sound and some of the neat things we see when that occurs. Um, like so much with chapters 25 and 26, waves and sound, there's so much subtlety that reading the book doesn't really do it justice. So we're here to talk a little bit about this together. I want to remind you um, that waves don't collide. They interfere. There's two types of interference. Constructive interference, where you have two pulses, let's say, on a string or a rope or something, and the, both pulses are displaced in the same direction, in this case, upward. At, when they arrive at the same time and place, they don't bounce off each other. They don't exert forces on each other. Waves are really just energy in a medium, in this case, the rope. At the moment they overlap, what's called the principle of superposition occurs, but basically they just add algebraically. If it's an up and an up, each having an amplitude of A, then the resulting pulse for a brief instant in time, just a moment in time when they're overlapping, is double the amplitude, 2A. So A plus A makes 2A. And that's building up, so we call that constructive interference. We are simplifying things a little bit, saying that either it's constructive or this other type of interference I'm going to talk about now, destructive. But essentially, those are the two types of interference. And destructive interference is the opposite of constructive. It takes away. It destroys the wave for a brief instant. Here I have a pulse that's oriented downward, a pulse that's oriented upward. They're traveling toward each other. At the moment, again, just the moment that they overlap, the energy is still there, but it doesn't appear to us to be there. The wave is destroyed for a moment. Um, sometime later, the, the downward pulse will be over here, the upward pulse will be over here, and it'll be the inverse of what you see right here. But for the moment that they overlap, they destructively interfere. You know, a key point, if we're going to move on between just re recalling what interference is and talking about standing waves, we got we got to emphasize this key point. It, I like to say it takes two to tango. That's an old saying about dancing and how you need a partner. For interference to occur, you have to have two or more wave pulses present at the same time and place. There's no other way for interference. You, one wave cannot interfere with itself. I'd like to show you something. Well, I'd like to show you a standing wave. I have a long helical spring. Um, and this is a good uh, way to demonstrate standing waves. So I'm going to send pulses down and try to create a standing wave. Um, a critical piece to understanding this, though, is to learn a little bit about something that happens when the wave undergoes reflection. So when the wave hits the tide, I've tied the other end of the spring to the chair. When it reaches, the wave reaches that boundary between the slinky and the chair, some of the energy goes into the chair, but most of it is reflected. Waves tend to reflect when there's a difference in media. The chair is very different than the slinky in its, in its elastic property. So it's, it's like a, a wall, and, and the, most of the wave will reflect. But when it reflects, it does something really neat. It, it inverts, that's the word we use. An up pulse reflects and comes back as a down pulse. A left pulse reflects and comes back as a right pulse. Have a look. One more pulse. And you can see that it, that it reflects in the opposite orientation that it was sent. It has inverted. Now, to make a standing wave, we talked about there have to be at least two waves present. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue to send pulse after pulse after pulse. And as those pulses start reflecting and coming back at me, we're going to have pulses that I'm sending, pulses that have reflected, coming back toward me, and of course these waves can interfere. A standing wave occurs when that frequency that I'm sending pulses, which is obviously, well, which is the same frequency they're coming back, right? If I send two shakes per second, two shakes per second are going to come back toward me after reflection. At certain frequencies, given the length of the, the spring and how stiff it is, certain frequencies produce a standing wave. And a standing wave is a place, is a wave where there are locations where constructive interference is always happening, 
and places where destructive interference is always happening. The destructive interference leads to things we call nodes, N-O-D-E-S, and the places where constructive interference is occurring lead to things we call anti-nodes. Let's have a look. So at first you can't see a standing wave because it takes a moment for the reflected waves to come back and that's the only time that interference can occur and a standing wave can be set up. Okay, here we go. Now, I chose a particular frequency that has led to a standing wave that has a node right between me and the chair. You see that place in the middle that's not really moving. It's right about here. Let me put a piece of tape down. And you can see there's an anti-node between that blue tape and the chair, and one between me and the blue tape. Now, that's not actually what's called the fundamental frequency. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on, on fundamental frequency and what, what are called harmonics, but, and those of you that know music know that, that that's a term we use in, um, in music as well. But let's just look at the fundamental frequency. It's less obvious that this is a standing wave, and that's why I don't start with the fundamental. But that is the fundamental frequency. Where there's a node at the end where the chair is, a node, my hand is a node, although I'm moving my hand to keep the wave going. But my hand is technically a node, and there's one anti-node in the middle. Now let's see if we can get a feeling for the rhythm. One, two, three, four. And the reason I did that, one, two, three, four, is because that other standing wave that I showed you first is exactly double the frequency of the fundamental. Have a look. We had one, two, or rather one, two, three, four. Now, one and two and one and three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I can actually, if I can shake faster, create standing waves with even more notes. That is always a multiple of the fundamental frequency. So you add it, you actually add a node every time you increase the frequency of the input force by a fundamental integer multiple of the fundamental. So 1F, 2F, 3F, 4F, etc. The video that we're going to link with this assignment um, is, a, is a teacher um, in his classroom doing this on a, on a wave generating machine, which is a little bit easier to control and perhaps will make it more uh, clear to you that what's going on. But he doesn't emphasize this point that in order for these standing waves to occur, you have to have two waves traveling in opposite directions, the ones you're sending and the ones that are reflecting. Now in sound, standing waves are kind of, kind of interesting. Perhaps you've never had the desire to do this. Um, many of you have done it before. By blowing your breath over the opening of the bottle, vibrations can be set up in the air you're blowing as it oscillates over the opening. And it, tur it turns out there's many different frequencies of vibrations, but the one you hear, the only one you hear, is the one that constructively interferes at the location of the opening and produces a standing wave. A little bit less air in this one.
produce one resonant. It turns out this is an example of resonance. Our last discussion um, was about resonance. Um, resonance occurs when a stand, standing wave is set up in a, in a material and you hear the, the, the frequency that is resonant. Um, now, the length of the air column is fixed unless I pour water out, in which case you hear a different resonant frequency produced by a different standing wave whose frequency is different. But for a given air column length and a given speed of sound, there's only one frequency that, that can... Well, that's not true. But you hear that one frequency. It turns out if I blow harder, I can make another resonant standing wave. Let's see if I can do that. Here's the first one, the so-called fundamental. You can hear that there's a, another resonant frequency, and of course there are more. Um, I probably can't blow air fast enough to, to create that other resonant frequency. But let's, let's talk about a, a common instrument. Um, this is a, a coronet looks a lot like a trumpet. They're almost the same instrument. The mouthpiece um, allows me to put my lips inside and, and have them vibrate. I can vibrate them at many frequencies. It's continuous. There's not discrete steps or individual notes. It's like a slide whistle, I can do almost any frequency. But when I connect it to the horn, the horn is a particular length. Um, and only certain frequencies will create a standing wave that constructively interferes with the vibration of my lips. To save your ears, I'm just going to put a little mute in here. Um, but let's, let's hear. Now I'm going to squeeze harder with my lips and try to do that that I was doing with just the mouthpiece. You can hear that only certain notes are possible. The continuous range is not possible connected to the longer horn. It only resonates at certain frequencies. Now, of course, if those are the only notes I could play, then it wouldn't be a coronet or a trumpet, it would be a bugle. And bugles don't have any keys, and so they can only play certain songs, like taps. Um, the start of a horse race has a, has a particular uh, song that's a bugle call. Um, I don't know that one, but you know, taps. <laughs> I'm not as capable of playing as I once was. But at any rate, those are the only note, those are some of the only notes that the people will play. The trumpet, though, the coronet has keys, valves. And these valves have little holes in them. And when you depress the key, it it changes the length of the instrument. It brings into the length of the instrument, well, for this third key this section of horn right here between my hands, fingers, um, that section of horn is not part of the instrument when the key is up and it becomes part of the instrument when the key is down. So it changes the length, which changes the resonant frequencies that create standing waves. <laughs> And because of the three keys and the three different length configurations, we can play far more notes than a bugle. We can play the scale. So, standing waves and sound. I've just talked about them. We saw a standing wave in the, in the long slinky but you can't really see sound waves. So how, how are they interfering? What's going on really with this? 
Waves are going down through the air column, and when they get to the water, they reflect backward. And remember, sound waves are compressions and rarefactions, areas where the air molecules are compressed a little more than average. Rarefractions, they're spread out more than average. And this, this travels through the air at the speed of sound, reflects back and interferes with whatever it is the source is doing. In this case, the air column I'm blowing is vibrating over the opening of the bottle. I'd like to show you something called a resonance tube. And here I can change the length, kind of like the trumpet, um, in a very simple way I can change the length of the air column inside the tube. Um, with, the, with the empty root beer bottle, I could only produce certain frequencies because the length was fixed. But I'm going to use a tuning fork whose frequency is fixed and see if I can get uh, a little bit better idea in your heads of what's going on in a standing wave and sound. Okay, so this is a super long, almost six foot um, acrylic tube, um, plastic walled tube, and I filled it up with some water that I put a little blue food coloring in so you could see the water level better. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna excite this fork, this happens to be 392 hertz, but that's not terribly important. Um, this will work with another fork. Although what you're gonna see would occur at different points in the air column were it a different fork. So 392, here we go. I'm gonna hold it over the opening. And you'll notice that there was nothing to notice, nothing happened. We, haven't, we don't have a resonant length for this fork. We can't set up a standing wave. The waves that are going down and reflecting off the water are not interfering in a way that creates nodes in certain places, stationary points and anti-nodes in the other places. You, that only occurs for particular frequencies. So I'm gonna let the water slowly out. I have a little clamp here that lets me allow some water to escape. So as you can see, water's coming out. Let's go ahead and set this up. R right, right there. Let me mark that point um, right here. I don't know if you can see that. Hopefully you can. Um, I'm going to close off the tube and put the water back in. I didn't fill it all the way back up. The reason for that is I'd like, if I can do this all at the same time, be coordinated, I don't know. I'm gonna um, activate the fork, hold it over, you're gonna hear it, and then I'm gonna fill the water back up to this black line, which I hope you can see is right above my fingernail here. Here we go. That is the resonant frequency. Now it turns out it's not terribly important that that, that occurs when this distance is a quarter of a wavelength or three quarters of a wavelength or five quarters of a wavelength, or seven, or nine, or 11, any odd integer multiple of a quarter wavelength produces a resonant frequency for what's called an open pipe, a pipe that, I'm sorry, a closed pipe, a pipe that's open only on one end. Uh, if, if the math is a little different for a pipe that's open at both ends, but I'm gonna go ahead and open up the, um, the water nozzle a little bit. I'm letting water out slowly. Um, and I want it 
if this is a quarter and then it happens again at three quarters, it's probably going to happen one, two, somewhere around here. Let's see. There it is. It was right about here. Let's see if we can catch that one more time. We're looking right around where my thumb is. Oh, I just missed it. going to be looking right around here where my thumb is. There it was. So that's a standing sound wave. Again, something you can't see readily because sound waves are invisible, but um, a phenomenon you were certainly able to hear. Um, I think that's it for now. Um, thanks again, and we'll We'll see you next time.